Thank you so much. Good to be with you again. Join me in a moment of prayer. Almighty God, Jesus promised that He would send the Spirit to guide us into all truth and to do extraordinary things in and through Your people. Enable us now so to hear Your Word and so to catch a glimpse of what You want to do in our world, that by Your Spirit we may be Your witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A good friend of mine was being interviewed for a job as rector of a parish in Montreal. This was back in the early 1980s. And one of the committee was an enthusiastic, charismatic layman. And when it came to his question, he turned to my friend and said eagerly, are you filled with the Spirit? And my friend was ready with the right answer. And you may know the right answer, which is, yes, but I leak. <laughs> so what's, what's the point of God's Spirit dwelling in us. Questions like that, along with questions about the signs that we have received the Spirit, what might happen in and through us and so on, and what is supposed to happen not only in but through the person in whom the Spirit comes to dwell, these things have been very controversial, as you will know well, and even divisive in many churches around the world. I was teaching in a class just now, and the last question I was asked concerned whether the gifts of things like tongues were meant to carry on or not. These things are still controversial, I know that. But that's a shame because it easily distracts attention from urgent tasks. And in the New Testament, the Spirit is not simply given so that we can feel good about being Jesus' followers, though hopefully that will happen at least some of the time. The Spirit is the vital agent for the church's life and mission, not simply in personal renewal and holiness, though that remains central. We need clear and strong teaching here, not just fussing over particular individual experiences, if we are to live in our generation as true and relevant followers of Jesus. You see, just as we in the Western churches have privatized Christianity in general, so we have privatized the work of the Spirit. We have seen the Holy Spirit as a force for what we call personal spiritual renewal, the reinvigoration of healthy Christian individual lives of prayer and service and study, a fresh injection of joy or peace when we are tired or bored or anxious. Now, that's important. I'm not saying anything against that. We all need that kind of renewal on a regular basis. And as my friend rightly noted, though, this is never about simply being filled with the Spirit as a one-off experience. As all wise pastors know, the Spirit can and does do extraordinary things in people's life. You can indeed be lifted onto a new level of personal spirituality. But this doesn't automatically protect you thereafter, either from sin or from sickness or from suffering. Life is more complicated than that. And when the living and glorious presence of God came to dwell in the wilderness tabernacle, this was near the start of the Israelites' journey to the promised land, not the sign that they had got there. And what the great Pentecostal renewals of the last century, which have done an enormous work around the world, what they have, I think, seldom if ever really grasped was what Jesus was talking about in John 16 in the passage we just heard. This isn't about what we might think of as new personal spiritual experiences, though no doubt it may involve that. Something quite different is going on. And it's expressed here by Jesus in such a dense and surprising manner that I suspect most of us skate over it and move on to what seems easier territory. And personal confession, I know these passages quite well because we read them every year in the Anglican liturgy. And for many years, I was always grateful that there was enough elsewhere in the passage to preach on and I didn't actually have to do business with these three tricky verses in the middle. But this is a vital part of John's overall teaching. And I want to suggest today that it's a vital part of the early church's life and should be ours as well. Now, as you probably know, John 16 comes within what we call the farewell discourses. On the night Jesus was going to be betrayed, he explained to the disciples after supper what was about to happen and what it would all mean. And a good deal of this focuses on the Holy Spirit, 
making these chapters one of the New Testament's central passages on the subject, along with chapters like Romans 8, which I was talking about the other day. These chapters include many sections and sayings of comfort and hope that when the Spirit comes, he will make Jesus present. He will make the Father and Jesus present to you. He will do new things through you. He will enable you to pray in new ways. Yes, indeed, all of that and more. But there are also severe passages of warning and commission. And this, John 16, is one of them. You see, Jesus has already explained to his disciples that just as the world has hated him, so it will hate them. Now, let's be clear about this. This way of talking about the world is not dualistic. John has emphasized right from the start that God so loved the world and that Jesus' mission was not to judge the world, but to save the world. And Jesus will go on in his great prayer in chapter 17 to stress that he is sending his disciples into the world. The kingdom is not, as he says uh, later on, the kingdom is not from the world, but it is certainly for the world. We often get that wrong because the old translation has Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world. So we assume, because we're modern Western Platonists, that that means that the kingdom is about escaping the world and going somewhere else. If you know anything about my work, you'll know I've spent a long time saying that that's the wrong way to read it. The kingdom is not from this world. It doesn't grow within this world. It comes from God, but it is for this world. So we're not dualists. But as it stands, and despite God's intention and purpose, the world is currently organized in opposition to God. <clears throat> the world wants to do its own thing. It wants to go its own way. And so the world in John, this isn't just the pagan nations outside Israel, but tragically, it includes at least the leaders of Israel itself. This world hates and tries to reject anyone who now points out God's way. Just as a child will stamp its foot when a parent or teacher tries to stop it doing uh, what it wants, particularly the child gets angry when the adult turns out to be right, leaving the child looking foolish as well as disobedient. So you can see what's going on here. The world hates what Jesus is doing because it is showing up the right way. And so Jesus warns that that's going to go on. There's going to be opposition to the kingdom message that his followers will live out and speak out. But he doesn't stop with that warning. There follows this commission. The language is dense and we need to unpack it. Let me read you the central verses again. Verses 8, 9, 10, 11. Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be wrong on three counts, sin, justice, and judgment. In relation to sin, because they don't believe in me. In relation to justice, because I'm going to the Father and you won't see me anymore. In relation to judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Well, you see what I mean? Faced with that, it's very kind of, what's he getting at? Please can we go on to something a bit more easy or at least comforting? We've got sin and justice and judgment, or in some translations, sin, righteousness and judgment. Three big worrying biblical terms. What's going on and what's it got to do with us? To answer that question, think for a moment where we are, where you are. You, my friends, have an extraordinary possibility open before you. We live in a worrying time of history when freedom and peace and truth itself seem to be wobbling before our eyes and everyone who tries to stand them back upright again only seems to make matters worse. We urgently need a new generation to take up the challenge of leadership in every sphere and to do so with wisdom and integrity. And we need particularly that new generation of explicitly Christian men and women who will take seriously the plight of the world and work and pray to bring the love and power and healing wisdom of the gospel to bear on the ills of our day. Because if we believe, which as Christians we must, that in Jesus and in his death the powers of corruption and darkness have been defeated, then we must also believe that this victory now needs to be implemented in the world, in every sphere, 
You know how it is. If you say to people, well, on the cross, Jesus defeated the powers of darkness and sin. People say, well, just look at the television, read the newspaper. It doesn't look to me as though the powers of darkness and sin have, have disappeared. Well, no, they haven't disappeared. The death blow has been given to them, but this victory has to be implemented. Are we to do that by ourselves? No. God does it by his spirit. This victory now needs to be implemented so that injustice and poverty and disease and corruption and inequality and licentiousness and war itself may no longer disgrace and deface God's lovely creation. If we believe with the New Testament that God intends to renew this sad old world from top to bottom and that with Jesus' resurrection he has gloriously launched that project of renewal, then we should be in the forefront of the task of putting that into practice. And you, who have such amazing advantages and possibilities in your country in general and in a place like this in particular, you have a special responsibility. You're probably bored with being reminded that much is expected of those to whom much is given, but it's just as true now as it was when your grandmother first said it to you. But what is it that's expected of us? Not just that we behave as renewed human beings, though of course we must, but that we accept Jesus' commission, the task he sets before us. And this is where this word in John's gospel, though it does apply to the whole church everywhere, applies, I believe, not least to you in particular. But hang on, you say, this passage isn't about me. It isn't even about the church. It's about the Spirit. Jesus is talking about what the Spirit is going to do. When the Spirit comes, the Spirit will do this and this and this. And for years, I used to read this passage and hear it as Jesus saying that when the Spirit comes, this is what the Spirit's going to be doing. And we're going to be kind of watching from the sidelines as the Spirit does that. No, that's not how it works at all. That's ridiculous. What the Spirit does, the Spirit does in and through Jesus' followers. The Spirit is given to enable Jesus' followers to do what it says here, which is, my friends, to hold the world to account. It is a primary task of the Spirit-filled church to hold the world to account, to speak the truth to power. This is not a little specialist task for people who want to be especially politically active. The exercise of this task, according to John's Gospel, is one of the Christian's primary spiritual experiences. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, expect this commission. And now we perhaps understand why the charismatic and Pentecostal movements have been seen in terms of personal renewal only because all Western culture, not only your country, where the split world of the Enlightenment is written into your constitution, bad luck, you have to live with that, the entire Western culture, we suffer from it too, but not kind of officially like that, we have constructed a world in which religion and spirituality are banished upstairs like an elderly relative who you might go and visit on Sunday afternoons, but who you don't expect to tell you how to run the rest of the house, while the downstairs world does its own thing in its own way. A world, in other words, that no Jew or early Christian would recognize. A world where, if the Spirit is going to do anything, the Spirit will presumably take us upstairs into some heavenly space where we'll have lovely experiences completely detached from the nasty downstairs world. A world, in other words, where John 16 becomes incomprehensible. The Spirit is not simply given so that Christians can have what we think of as heavenly experiences. The point of the gospel is that God's kingdom is coming on earth as in heaven, so that the truly heavenly experience, if that's what you want, is actually to be found when through the humble and often suffering witness of Christians, the powers of the world are called to account. This concerns all of us. This is part of our vocation, not just, as I say, for a few specialists. Jesus is talking about the witness of the entire church. So what does it look like? Jesus is saying that the life and witness of the church, how we live as well as what we say, must show up the world and its false ways of life. That could easily be heard as though I'm 
trying to inculcate a generation of prigs. No. If you're a genuine Christian, you could never be a prig because you will know the darkness in your own heart and you will only ever be able to do this work in a humble spirit. But Jesus is saying that the church's life and teaching must embody the fact that God is putting the world right. And that this justice, this putting right, is the true justice over against the false versions of justice that prevail in the world. And Jesus is saying that the church in its life as well as its teaching must demonstrate to the watching world that the Creator God has already passed judgment on rebellion and wickedness and that this judgment will have its full effect. That is basically what these verses about are about. Let's just probe a little deeper. First, Jesus says, the Spirit will prove the world wrong about sin because they don't believe in me. Okay, what happens when we unpack that? Well, as in Paul, so in John, belief in Jesus is the telltale symptom of whether someone is living the truly human life or is instead living the less than fully human life. The name for the latter being sin, missing the mark of genuine humanness. The world has its own standards of right and wrong and they are out of sync with God's standards. Sometimes they overlap, often they don't. The watching world in the first few centuries couldn't figure out what these early Christians were up to. They didn't cheat in business, they didn't cheat on their spouses, they didn't cheat on their neighbors. They took care of the poor, whoever and wherever they were. Nobody else was behaving like that. All of those behaviors were simply incomprehensible to most people. The Christians were showing up the world, demonstrating that the world had got it wrong, there was a different way to be human and that the key to it all and the telltale symptom of it all was believing in Jesus, convicting the world of sin because they don't believe in me. But second, the Spirit will prove the world wrong about justice. Justice is not, alas, the absolute and agreed upon category some philosophers would like. Actually, it's not agreed upon from Plato's Republic through to Rawls and the other theories of justice that some of you study. There are all sorts of different things and controversies going on. But justice can be and often has been bent to suit the powerful. Jesus bends it back straight again as he goes to the cross and as God vindicates him in the resurrection and ascension. God's great act of putting the world right, of justice, is well and truly launched when God, in language the early Christians themselves used, puts Jesus right, demonstrating that his crucifixion was a vile travesty of justice. Jesus' vindication then sets the tone for the Christians to be in the power of the Spirit, putting right people for the world. And here, of course, they run into danger. You see this spectacularly in the book of Acts. The earliest apostles are hauled before the magistrates in Jerusalem, the, the chief priests and the rulers, and they're told not to preach any more in the name of Jesus. And they solemnly declare that they're going to ignore the court's ruling because they must obey God rather than human authorities. Now, there is a straight line from there in the early chapters of Acts to people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King and a host of others. It isn't just that such people are taking a brave stand, though they are, they are embodying the fact that the Spirit is proving the world wrong about justice, proving that the courts of this world can and do get it wrong. This is a dangerous line to tread because in many countries, including yours and sometimes in mine, People are all too ready to say, oh, the authorities, the government, Washington, the courts, whoever, are getting it wrong. Therefore, we've got to hive off and do something totally independent and arm ourselves to the teeth and prepare for some great... No, that's not how it works. It works as we see in the book of Acts. For instance, when the magistrates in Philippi, in Acts 16... You know what's happened, this great story when Paul preaches and bad things happen and he gets thrown into prison and they're singing hymns at midnight as you do and the walls fall down with the earthquake and the jailer rushes in, he's going to commit suicide and um, Paul says, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved and he does and it's all wonderful and extraordinary and it acts as such a page turner, it's an amazing book. Then in the morning, the magistrates send word to the prison, tell those men to leave town. 
Paul isn't satisfied with that. His job is to hold the world to account. So he reminds them that he's a Roman citizen, has been beaten without charge and imprisoned without trial, and deserves a public apology, and he gets it. I've often said Paul must have been very high maintenance as a friend. <laughs> but Paul was proving the world wrong about sin and justice and judgment. And then later, the Roman governor, Felix, keeps asking Paul to come and talk to him. Paul's a great talker, and Felix enjoys all this stuff, philosophical, religious, whatever. Actually, Felix is hoping for a bribe. But Paul instead turns the conversation to righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment, which scares Felix so much he adjourns the discussion. Anyone would think Paul had been reading John 16. He is holding the world to account proving the world wrong, declaring to the ruler of the world, or at least his, Rome, his local representative, that there is a different ruler. See, as far as Felix was concerned, sin, what was that? You, you take what you can in life. Justice meant Roman justice, which could easily be bent, especially if there were bribes involved. Thank you very much. And judgment, well, he was going to give final judgment, and the thought that somebody else might do that was just nonsense for him couldn't make sense of it. But for Paul, there is a different ruler, a different standard of judgment. And Rome itself, from Caesar on his throne down to Felix and beyond, comes under that judgment like everybody else. The Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. What would it look like for Jesus' followers to do the same thing today in our modern Western democracies or in the larger councils of the world? I think it might look like some of you saying your prayers, studying the key issues in all their complexity. We don't want any amateurish sounding off. It's got to be thought through and worked out. And then being ready in the way you and your Christian communities live, as well as what you say, to prove the world in the wrong about sin and justice. And then thirdly, about judgment itself, because, says Jesus, the ruler of this world is judged. The powers of the world, you see, do their utmost by putting Jesus to death. Jesus says in John 12, when the Greeks come to the feast and want to see him, he doesn't say, okay, let's meet um, down the road later on and have a chat. Jesus knows that until he's done what he has to do, the pagan nations cannot come into God's kingdom because they're in, they're in the grip of the idols that have ruled the world, the ruler of this world. So Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And if I am lifted up on the cross, lifted up from the earth, then I will draw all people to myself. Jesus' death is going to be the victory over the enslaving powers, which is why the crucifixion leads directly, as John and Paul see so clearly, to the Gentile mission. Now at last, of course, they can come in because the powers that have held them captive have been defeated. So what happens is that the powers of the world do their utmost to Jesus, and that turns out to be his victory over them. And then when the Spirit comes... The Spirit-led church, in its corporate life as well as its vocal witness, will testify that Jesus is Lord and that neither Caesar nor any other would-be lords deserve that title. And in John's Gospel, all this comes to a head in chapters 18 and 19, where Jesus faces Pontius Pilate. Read that scene carefully. This is what it looks like when the kingdom of God confronts the kingdoms of the world. What do they talk about? Kingdom and truth and power. Until Pilate shrugs his shoulders. What is truth? The only truth he knows is the truth that the empire makes with its swords. And then he uses his brutal power. And he thinks he's establishing Caesar's kingdom by having Jesus killed. If you let this man go, they say, you're not a friend of Caesar. Well, Pilate, of course, wants to be a friend of Caesar. Who wouldn't? So, therefore, Jesus gets killed. But in fact, the whole point of John's gospel, as comes out so clearly in the book of Revelation, in Colossians and elsewhere, is that this is how God's power, the power of self-giving love, the power of utterly true truth, the power of God's kingdom, is being established. 
And then after that, the risen Jesus breathes the Spirit upon his disciples and says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. That's the transition. That's how it works. Our passage in John 16 means that by the Spirit, we are to do and be in the world of our day what Jesus did and was in front of the Jewish authorities and Pontius Pilate. And the world may well react as Pilate did. That has happened from the very beginning, from the stoning of Stephen through to those heroic martyrs who were killed on the shores of Libya just a year or two ago, and others tragically even in our own day. But that might just be the way to the victory. It's happened again and again. Read Second Corinthians, read the whole of Christian history about that and see. My challenge to you this morning, therefore, is whether you are prepared to pray your way through John 18 and 19 and ask yourself, no, ask God, Ask yourself in the presence of God, in the power of the Spirit, what would it mean? How do we so understand what today's powers are doing? It's not so obvious. There isn't anyone like Pilate just sitting there saying it or standing there saying it. We have to think our way into how the forces, as we call them, of economics, politics, um, all the other things that are going on, how they are actually doing what they're doing so that we are then prepared to hear that as so. As the Father sent me, so I send you, now receive the Spirit. Because when the Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and justice and judgment. So pray that the Spirit will enable you, and just as important, the whole church community where you are, to bear the equivalent witness before the powers of the world. You see, I fear that in our modern systems, we Christians have largely abdicated that vocation. We've separated ourselves. We let the world do its own internal critique. Well, you know what happens when, in my country, when there's some glitch and the police do something stupid, they say, we will have an inquiry. And then it's police um, doing an inquiry about other police. And the world looks on and says, well, you're just covering your backs. Multiply that up. Massively. Who holds the rulers to account? Oh, we have two party democracies, so one party holds the other one to account. The trouble is, all sides consist of millionaire politicians. It's not a great way to start the critique. And so then the press and the media, they claim that they hold the government to account. You go to the headquarters of the Chicago Tribune in downtown Chicago, there's a massive marble opening foyer with carved in gilt letters in this marble. The great truth from whichever newspaper magnate it was who put, put it there, that the politicians can't hold themselves to account, so we the newspapers, we the media need to do it. But the trouble is that the media too are riddled with special interests and unaccountable prejudices. My friends, it was always the church's God-given role, vocation, that by the life we lead and the words we speak, we will speak the truth to power. God's truth, through our humility and weakness and care for the poor and sharp words of wisdom. And of course, in the middle of that, we can't get on our high horse because the church often gets it wrong and we too need to be held to account. That's why we need proper structures of accountability within the church and we need to allow for prophetic ministries within the church which will point out when the church is getting a bit too fond of, its own, of the sound of its own voice and thinks that it can tell the world what to do. That danger that the church too needs to be held to account must not stop us from embracing our vocation. When the Spirit comes, the Spirit will enable us, you, to speak and live the truth that Jesus is Lord, that there is a new way to be human, that there is a true justice, that arrogant power has already been judged and will one day be overthrown forever. My friends, this vocation is at the heart of genuine Christian spiritual experience. And when you pray to be filled with the Spirit, you are praying for that experience. Let's just pray together as we close. Almighty Father, give us your spirit as Jesus promised to his followers so that we may be for and in the world what he was and what he did may be implemented through our witness so that he may be glorified and your kingdom may come on earth 
as in heaven. Amen.